Go is a compiled language that was built for high performance web servers by Google. They built it to make high performance, easy to write web servers. So of course, Go is gonna have better high performance web servers. That's just how this stuff works. So in the Go world, I like hosting it on a server environment. Over the past few years, serverless has become more and more popular. More and more people have started adopting it. More and more platforms like Vercel, Netlify, and all these other platforms are using serverless under the hood to make their products faster and better and easier to use. So should you be using serverless? Well, maybe. Before I get into that, make sure that you guys are subscribed. I'm going to be doing new backend content every single day all the way through February 28th of this year. I'm going to have a lot of stuff for backend, bit of full stack, probably not that much front end, but probably going to get back into TypeScript stuff sometime next week. I have a few big things planned for Go over the next couple days, but we'll see how it goes. But for now, let's talk about servered and serverless hosting. So the first thing we need to talk about is what the heck is serverless. So a servered hosting is the most basic and simple. It's exactly what you would think it is. It's you have a little box and it sits in the cloud and that is your server you're paying some cloud provider to basically rent out to you a cpu some ram and maybe some storage if you pay extra for it some platforms like uh, fly will offer a service called volumes where what that will do is you can attach a little storage box to your server in the cloud so that you can put save data on it but effectively that's all it is it's just a little box that exists out in the cloud that you're renting to use and run your server on you'll pay some fee they typically charge by the second or the minute or whatever it's usually around like six bucks a month to get a cheap little instance that you can run your app on host it do whatever you want certain platforms will manage this more or less for you you can have a platform like Linode which will go through and basically just literally give you a Linux box in the cloud that you can do literally anything you want with or you can have more managed platforms like Railway or Fly where you can basically just give them a docker file or some or they're even smart enough at this point to know oh this is just a go app or something and they'll just take it and then they can load it up for you put it out in the cloud and it's done so that's all server hosting is. It's just a way to put your apps in the cloud. It's basically just renting servers in the cloud, but serverless, serverless is a lot more interesting. Serverless is a pattern where you're not actually hosting out you're not actually renting out a server. Your server isn't always going to be existing at all times. You only pay for what you use. And what does that mean? That means that whenever an end user makes a request, your server is going to spin up. It's going to spin up a new instance for that user. It'll serve to that user and then it'll die. This is a bit of an oversimplification of what's really happening under the hood. But generally speaking, the way I like to think about it is when the end user makes a request, it'll go up to the server. The server will spin up a new instance. These are often referred to as lambdas because AWS lambdas one of the one of the first serverless platforms and it's one of the ones that is used under the hood for tons of these different platforms basically you're just spinning up that lambda it will execute and run your request and then it'll die so instead of having to pay all the time so instead of just renting out a little box in the cloud you're only paying for how many times you invoke those so they're both typically charged by the second so say like a serverless instance is typically billed by like some equation usually some function of like the amount of time it takes to execute the amount of time you're executing request times however powerful your instance is like on aws it's certain amount of cents per execution second or whatever so say you have 10 million requests in a month each uh, request takes a second to execute you'll have 10 million seconds billable and then you calculate out what that ends up being it's probably gonna be really really cheap i mean that's not actually that much in the grand scheme of things versus on a server environment it doesn't matter how many requests you have it's just going to be that flat six dollars for that base little box so two very different ways of hosting it but one thing that's super important to note here is that your serverless environments do not persist anything these are just getting spun up and down based on whether or not you're getting requests so there's no state on your server it's completely stateless so this is one of those things that you need to get used to if you're going to use like next.js for your backend or something like that that is a stateless backend if you need to persist something if you need to store something you have to do that somewhere else if you want to cache something if you want to write something to disk if you want to host a service like pocketbase or something like that you can't do it in a serverless next.js type environment well next yeah next.js is typically serverless because it's typically hosted on Vercel. So you have no state within your server versus if you have a server environment, I could like have a cache going or have like an internal variable stored on my server so that every time an end user makes a request, I'll increment that counter by one and I can just keep incrementing that counter up and up and up and up and it'll keep persisting versus if I had a serverless environment, that counter will get reset every couple of requests. Again, I'm not entirely certain exactly how they work under the hood. That's the magic of AWS engineers, which I don't really know what they do, how they make these work, but the general principle is they get spun up and spun down and you cannot rely on any persistent up there you cannot rely on any persistence within a serverless instance so with all that said which one should you be using and the honest answer is I think it kind of depends on the language for me and all of my go apps they are hosted on a servered platform and typically speaking this is 
it, you can do either one, but for me, the way I like to write my Go apps and stuff, I actually like having the servered backend because it gives me the ability to have a persistent database connection that's just always open. I just have that set up and Go is such a powerful and efficient language that I can just put a nice little $6 container up there. Hell, I host on Railway and I don't even get charged because it's so efficient and cheap that even though we're serving hundreds of thousands of requests, it's just so freaking efficient and I cash so well and Go is just such an absurd language that I, it's below the $5 a month uh, developer fee. So you can use these super high performance languages that are super efficient like Go or Rust or Zig or any of these crazy languages to really get tons of performance out there. And that's one of the big benefits of Go is you can get this almost system level performance on a language that has a garbage collector, which is just crazy. Comparing it to the performance of something like TypeScript, it's going to be a lot worse. And I think at the TypeScript world serverless is almost always your best option personally i would always host my typescript apps if i had to write a typescript backend in serverless because i would only ever write a typescript backend in a next.js nuxjs meta framework type world i'm going to make another video updating this but the more i've kind of gotten into this and the more i've been writing go i've been writing a ton of go lately been doing hours of go every single day really trying to dial this out been working on huge new updates for insider viz and the more i write it the more I'm like, you know, TypeScript, I'm not a huge fan. This is it's a video for another day. But in the TypeScript world, TypeScript is far less efficient than Go. There is no way you can argue otherwise. Do look up any video that's a performance benchmark between TypeScript and Go. Just watch the video. Enjoy the fireworks of the little graph that they're going to put up. And you're going to see Go is going to be down here and TypeScript is going to be way up here. That's just how it works. That is just the reality we live in. And that's not a bad thing. That doesn't mean that TypeScript is a stupid language. It just means that it was not designed for backend development. We're comparing apples and oranges here. When you compare Go to TypeScript, you're comparing a language that was that is a, a superset of an, another language javascript which was built in like a week and it's designed to be the language that interfaces with the web front end to move images around that's what it was designed for obviously it's been innovated and expanded on and stuff like v8 and bun and all this stuff like yeah it can do a lot more but it wasn't built for that go is a compiled language that was built for high performance web servers by google they built it to make high performance easy to write web servers so of course go is going to have have better high performance web servers. That's just how this stuff works. So in the Go world, I like hosting it on a server environment because I can get all of the benefits of having a server. If I want to cache something, if I want to keep stuff open, if I want to have just that persistence, then that's great. And one thing that I don't have to eat when I have that server environment is cold starts. Cold starts are something that you're going to have to deal with in the Lambdas world, in the serverless world. And that's something that technologies like Prisma and TypeScript and all these are really dealing with. And they're actually making huge strides. Prisma has been doing some really great work to help mitigate cold starts and help mitigate and help improve the serverless environment. Because typically speaking, if you're writing a TypeScript backend, from my experience, at least 90% of people are going to be using Prisma. Prisma has kind of become the default in the TypeScript world. And for good reason, it's an incredible package. It is the single most elegant and efficient way to write database queries I've ever used. It just makes it so freaking easy. I cannot, there's a project I'm working on at work and I've hit a pretty crazy deadline on it. That was a ton of work. I had to work a ton of extra hours, but I still hit it. And the only reason I think I hit it is because I was able to leverage stuff like Prisma, TRPC, Next.js, all that in one code base. There's a reason people love them and that I honestly love them myself, but I think that they just, you know, they don't fit everywhere. But in that sort of space, the cold starts can be a huge problem. And in Go, you don't have to eat cold starts. You don't have to wait for everything to spin up again, because if you think about it, if you have a server environment that doesn't exist anymore, well, you have to spin that up. You have to partition the resources. You have to go and you have to implement, you have to start up the server. You have to run everything. Then you can go ahead and execute it. Then you can actually use it. But we have to wait for that to happen. So what's nice is go, you don't have to do that. But then over in the TypeScript world, I argued that serverless is better. And I stand by that because if you try and vertically scale, when I say vertically scale, what I'm referring to is just taking one little CPU box out in the cloud and just making it bigger and bigger. Just every time you increase your users, you just buy a bigger CPU and you get to a point where you're just basically buying a MacBook Pro out in the cloud that's serving all your things. It's an oversimplification oversimplification, but that's generally the concept. So you have this little box out in the cloud that's going to serve all your requests. And 
in Go, you can scale that really easily. And it can scale like if you look at Pocketbase's documentation, they have a note on there where like 10,000, like a tiny little $6 instance can serve 10,000 concurrent requests, I think. I'll put the number up on screen if I double check that off. That's by rote. But I think that's what it is. It's some it's some insane number, super cheap. You couldn't do that in TypeScript. Again, go refer to any of those performance videos. I'm going to make one of my own because I just want to and I want to really lay clear what the difference between these two languages is. But TypeScript and Go are not comparable performance wise. And if you're comparing them by performance, it's just wrong. But anyways, back on topic. I know I'm kind of everywhere on this, but going back into it with the in the TypeScript world with the serverless stuff. So if we don't have to eat those. We have to eat those cold starts. But the reason why it's still better to use the lambdas is because we can then scale that infinitely. So we don't have to worry about the fact that a TypeScript server is going to bottleneck way faster than a Go server is that if we get X number of concurrent requests into a node server, it's going to just start bottlenecking and crashing and getting really slow. So that means that we need some way to scale it. And then the traditional ways to do that would be something like horizontally scaling it, which is what a Kubernetes Docker solution is, where every time you try and scale it horizontally, you're going to be adding more and more Docker pods in there, which is effectively just adding more servers and expanding and contracting as needed. And that's a valid way to do it. That does work. But I think that serverless is a more elegant way to do this because you don't have to deal with all that config. Setting up Kubernetes and Docker and all that stuff is hard. It's not easy to do. I've tried to do it. I've successfully done it, but it wasn't fun and I didn't like it. And just going in and clicking the deploy button on Vercel is a lot nicer. So what I can do is in the TypeScript world, I can get the really nice DX, but I can also just get that scalability and performance with a serverless environment yeah it's still technically going to be slower than a go server is but it's going to have better dx and i mean that's sort of when we get into the pros and cons which is again a topic for another video i need to stop digressing but my point is in a in a typescript type environment i highly recommend a serverless type platform and that's going to be like a vercel a nextjs a lambda and for me a Vercel, Netlify, Lambda, something like that. And the reason why I recommend this is because in TypeScript world, I would almost, if I'm going to be writing a TypeScript backend, I'm going to be doing it with a Next app, a Nuxt app, a SvelteKit app, something like that. I don't really, the more I get into Go, the more I really think that I wouldn't write a standalone Express server, or a Fastify, or an SJS. I wouldn't do that anymore. I think Go is for this kind of thing for like standalone web server backend development i think go is a superior language it's a video for another day but hopefully you got something out of this i know this was kind of all over the place um apologize for that but again this is my point with lambdas and with with serverless and servered you gotta know where you're gonna you gotta know which one you want to host on you gotta figure they both have a lot of good and a lot of bad to them but kind of depends on the language and your use case so little tilt tldr go servered typescript serverless and with all that said have a great day